Hi everybody, Dana Sparks, broker of Maximum One Greater Atlanta Realtors. And today's contract tip is a little bit different. It, it's not really a contract tip. Uh, it has to do with running your business as a business and some steps you can put into place for uh, customer service for your clients and customers and prospects and for uh, protection for you regarding fair housing issues and just for consistency and systems. So it has to do with uh, basically systems uh, that you, ideas for some systems and checklists for you to put into place with respect to your real estate practice. Um, I just finished teaching a fair housing CE class today, and this was part of the class that I taught and decided that this would make a really good uh, video. So basically the issue is, uh, again, well, you might want to consider creating a standard operating procedure booklet or manual for your real estate practice. You are an independent contractor. You are self-employed. You are in business for yourself. So the broker who holds your license will also have a policy and procedures manual uh, that protects the brokerage and has guidelines as to how you as an agent, if you choose to work with that broker, are to operate. But I suggest that you as a practitioner, a real estate practitioner, have your own policies and procedures manual uh, in place for, like I said, your protection, protection of your license, uh, to, to do what you can to make sure you don't violate any fair housing laws, as well as for uh, excellent customer service for your buyer and your seller clients. So here are some of the ideas uh, to consider. You want to be able to have something in place, some sort of policies, procedures, guidelines, checklists, so forth and so on in place regarding a variety of areas within your practice. Number one, communication and interaction. Number two, paperwork. Number and documentation and the, and the transmission of that. Uh, number three, appointments. And number four, marketing. Um, so for example, with respect to communication, you want to have these, or be able to demonstrate uh, I teach sometimes with worst case scenario in mind. And in other words, when I say demonstrate, if you have to, uh, if you are ever in front of a judge, an arbitrator, uh, a fair housing HUD, uh, uh, looking at a fair housing, uh, a potential fair housing violation, uh, an NAR ethics committee, an NAR arbitration committee, um, a broker, Grec, any of those things, or even just a co-op broker, a co-op agent, a co-op client. You want to be able to demonstrate that you have the same communication with every prospect, customer, and client. You want to treat every prospect, customer, and client the same way. You want to use the same lingo. You want to be able to exert the same effort. You want to uh, show them the same forms, use the same scripts, provide them with the same information, and have the same policies and procedures. Regarding interaction, you want to have equal interaction. You want to show equal respect, equal enthusiasm, e provide equal service, uh, make equal availability of your time and attention to any and all prospects and clients, uh, share equal information, and equal delivery method of information and communication. Regarding uh, but your buyer and your seller appointments, you want to have it systematic with the procedures that you do in interacting with them as prospects, the paperwork that you have, the methodology, the discussion, so forth and so on. So you want to have a list of questions that you ask every prospect. For example, for a seller, you want to ask them the reason for selling, whom the decision makers are, what is their target closing date, what is their mortgage payoff amount, are there any known defects or repairs needed with the property, so forth and so on. Uh, for a buyer, for example, you might want to ask, what is the type of home they are looking for? 
Uh, what are the number of bedrooms and number of bathrooms they are looking for? What area? What is their target move date? Uh, ask them about their financing, proximity to work, schools, so forth and so on. But you want to have these questions listed and systematic so that you can demonstrate that you ask every single buyer the same questions and every single seller the same questions. In the summer of 2020, the Georgia Association of Realtors actually published uh, uh, a sample set of questions for buyers. And they included the list such as, do you want a new existing or historic home? What is your price range? What is the size home you are looking for? Regarding price range right now, I might add, do you have cash for the difference between an appraisal and the contract price? Is that something you are willing to pay? Do you want a condominium, townhome, detached property, attached property, single family home, or investment property? What types of things do you want to live near? How far away from those things do you want to live? For example, work, fam uh, medical facility, other family in the area, recreational areas, so forth and so on. How many bedrooms would you like to have? Do you want to live on a single floor or a multi-floor home? Do you want a yard? If so, how large? What type? Do you want a swimming pool? Is there a particular style of home that you want? For example, do you want a traditional home, contemporary home? Uh, what Do you want an open floor plan? Do you want a home with a basement? Do you want a home with the living quarters on the main level or on one of the upper levels or the lower level? What about the construction of the home? Do you want it brick, wood, vinyl, stucco? Do you want to be near a particular road or highway or public transportation? Do you want to live in an urban area, suburban area, or rural setting? Is there a specific school district you want to live in? Is the ceiling height important to you? Is the uh, uh, width of the doorways and the hallways and the front door important to you? Do you want an eat-in kitchen? Do you have any special desires or requirements for the home you buy? Do you have a list of must-haves versus would-like-to-haves? Um, if you go to the Georgia Association of Realtors website, garealtor.com, you can find a list of more questions. Uh, and that's just a sample from GAR from 2020 for buyers. Regarding your appointments, you absolutely want to have systematic buyer and listing appointments. You want to have the same documents for every buyer and seller. Um, and actually, back to the questions too, you want to ask uh, for every buyer, for example, is it important to you the direction the home is facing? Is it important to you if there has been a death that has occurred in the home, either by natural causes or unnatural causes? Um, you want to ask... Um, well, like I said, those would be some important questions to ask every single buyer. So now to your appointments, you want to have the same documents for every buyer and every seller. For example, for some sellers, you want to have an interview form. You want to have a listing agreement, and a seller net sheet. You want to have a marketing plan. You want to have consumer brochures. You want to have your company's affiliated business disclosure. You want to have a wire fraud disclaimer. You want to have a property disclosure form, a community association exhibit, a lead-based paint exhibit, if that's appropriate, fair housing information, etc. For a buyer, you want to have an interview form, a buyer brokerage agreement, and a cash-to-close uh, worksheet. You want to have a sample contract. I would add the sample contract to the seller, uh, seller package, too. You want to have consumer brochures, affiliated business disclosure, wire fraud dis disclaimers, uh, vendor list. I would have a vendor list for the seller as well. Fair housing information. Um, in this market that we're in right now, this is August 2021. No, this is July 2021. Um, uh, we are seeing a lot of buyers paying cash over an appraisal price and going into offers with no appraisal contingency, no financing contingency, so forth and so on. You want to have a disclosure about what that means to that buyer and what that will mean in the future when they go to sell that house. Um, so those are just some examples of some of the documents that you want to have for 
every single seller with whom you meet and every single buyer with whom you meet. Again, keeping in mind, number one, it will make your workflow more consistent and uh, you can demonstrate that you are hopefully not violating any fair housing laws or showing any discriminatory preferences by being consistent and doing the same thing, the same paperwork for every client, prospect, customer. You want to have consistent business policies and procedures. In other words, a list of, this is how I work. For example, I only accept calls between 8 a.m. and 9 p.m. And you want to be equally available for all. I always meet buyers at the office for the initial meeting. I only show properties to pre-qualified buyers. If you do it for one, you must do it for all. I ask for identification from every buyer. If you do it for one, you must do it for all. I only show or list properties in blank area because those are the areas in which I have expertise. I market properties on whatever MLS service and the internet, but I do not do any print advertising. I do not hold open houses. When I am unavailable, the agent who covers my business is agent name, email address, phone number. If you ever have an issue, my broker is broker's name, email address, phone number, etc. Those are just some ideas of some of the issues to address in your own practice of your, your, poli your standard operating procedure or policies and procedures manual for your own individual practice. You want to be able to provide resources for your public, objective resources for information, whether these be online, police departments, chambers of commerce, published reports, MLS statistics, so forth and so on. For example, a resource for demographic information for a particular area, school reports, crime statistics, not, not that you're giving those, but where your prospect can go to get those, where your prospect can go to get school information, rankings, vendor lists, loan type information, county information, for example, county uh, tax rates, millage rates. Is there a county tax assessed or just a city tax assessed or both? Zoning, uh, proposed development, etc. Never, ever, ever do your clients due diligence for them on the sell side or on the buyer side. Is flood insurance required? So forth and so on. That is, those are questions to put to your clients customers that they need to go then find the information for. If you give out this information to one client, you must provide this list of resources where they can go to get that to all clients. Do not use any data sources to discriminate or show any sort of discriminatory preference. You have availability and access to a ton of documentation in both the GAR contract package and the RE forms contract package. You, I suggest that you look through all of those consumer brochures and keep those and give those out to every prospect with whom you work when it's appropriate on the buyer side or the seller side. For example, in the Georgia Association of Realtors package, there is the ABCs of agency, lead-based paint pamphlet, mold pamphlet, EPA home buyers and sellers guide to radon pamphlet, protect yourself when selling a home, protect yourself when buying a home what to consider when buying a home in a community with a homeowners association, what to consider when buying a condominium, protect yourself when buying a home to be constructed, what buyers should know about flood hazard areas and flood insurance, what buyers and sellers should know about short sales and distressed properties, what new landlords need to know about leasing property. In addition, in the RE forms contract package, there are a dish similar and uh, a bit different consumer brochures. Lead-based paint, of course, there's the disclosure and the EPA lead-based paint pamphlet. EPA's brief guide to mold moisture in your home. DeKalb County plumbing disclosure exhibit. EPA citizens guide to radon. Home selling the process, home buying the process. Renting property, the process. Transactions involving out-of-state residents. I would also include 
EPA pamphlets and HUD pamphlets. If you go to www.epa.gov and www.hud.gov, you will find a extraordinary number of consumer brochures and pamphlets that you would want to consider offering in your list of documentation that you give your buyer prospects and your seller prospects. In addition, here in Georgia, we have the Georgia Department of Community Affairs, or DCA, that has a lot of pamphlets that you will also find useful, uh, including a pamphlet on the Georgia Fair Housing Act. Uh, there's also a Georgia Landlord Tenant Handbook that if you have a, uh, a public person who is going to be a tenant or a public person who's going to be a landlord, that you should direct them to downloading that and going through that. There is the NAR, National Association of Realtors, Declaration on Fair Housing. I suggest you include that in your documentation for both buyers and sellers. Uh, in addition, you would want to have brokerage policies regarding anything that may be relative to the topic of customer service or fair housing or policies and procedures. For example, your brokerage might have a policy if the buyer puts in earnest money on a personal check, there might be a brokerage policy on the time frame within which the, the broker is going to hold the funds until they can act on that. So for example, if let's say there's a 10 day banking hold on personal checks, buyer goes under contract, writes a personal check for earnest money, terminate within five days, buyer wants their earnest money back or wants to apply it to another property. Well, if your company has a policy on holding that personal check, it might not be available when the buyer thinks it's going to be available. So you're going to want to provide that type of policy information in your own standard operating procedure for your own practice. Um, and then again, I, can, I, I kind of glossed over it, but I cannot emphasize enough that you absolutely want to include um, sample purchase and sale agreements for your buyers and your sellers the moment you first meet with them as prospects. What you're going to do is have a, uh, a blank purchase and sale agreement. You're going to write for information purposes only because you cannot share the blank documents with the public, but you're going to write on it for information purposes only. You are going to get these blank purchase and sale agreements and the exhibits and the amendments, so forth and so on, into the hands of your public buyers and sellers and ask them to review it, go over it, and ask you any questions. You want to do this before you ever initiate an offer or receive an offer or a counter offer so that you can address your public's questions and so your public buyers and sellers understand what it is they are going to agree to, what promises they agree to make, what the consequences are uh, if they don't follow through with what they said they're going to do, if they default on the contract, what the remedies for the default is, uh, how their earnest money is protected, how their rights are protected, when they can terminate, when they can't terminate, all of that information that is pre-printed in the purchase and sale agreement, uh, either in the Georgia Association of Realtors contract or the RE forms contract, if they're going to look for new construction, you're going to want to go and get a, co a sample copy of that new construction contract. Again, you want to be able to have this discussion and provide your, the customer service to your public before it is an issue of actually having to negotiate or make a counter offer uh, with an actual offer on the line. Um, in addition, you want to go over timeframes and deadlines. There is a time frame and deadline and date. Uh, uh, marketing piece, so to speak, or informational piece in the Georgia Association of Realtors contract package. Um, take some time and come up with some consistent checklists, procedures, documents, pamphlets, brochures, resources for information, vendor lists, so forth and so on, that you provide to your buyers and sellers. Because again, you want to be able to demonstrate consistency. So I've done an, uh, uh, an email, uh, an email. <laughs> I've done a video below on love letters um, and I'll link that below. And uh, love letters has been a, a fairly uh, hot topic lately with the crazy fast sellers market that we are in, not only locally here in Georgia, but at the national level, at the National Association of Realtors as well. 
and uh, also within discussions of fair housing. And the love letters are definitely can be construed as a, or can be a potential violation of fair housing rights if a seller, uh, if a listing agent presents a love letter with a particular offer and if the seller selects that buyer's offer based on the love letter. So a lot of buyer's agents think, well, gosh, they're effective. They work. They may work. That's going to be an issue for the seller and the listing agent, not me. No, no, no. You buyer's agents, you too could be uh, uh, charged with violating fair housing if you cannot demonstrate that you never, never write the love letter for your client. But if you demonstrate that the client wrote their own love letter and you sent it to the listing agent. Well, do you do that for every buyer client with whom you work? Uh, a client that you did not do that for? Did you raise the topic with that client? That person could say you were showing a discriminatory preference against them because you didn't even talk about a love letter or offer to send it to the seller. So this is an issue with buyer's agents as well as listing agents. Um, and also, uh, this is a whole nother topic, but I just want to kind of bring it to your attention because it has come up lately. With short-term rentals, if you are helping your public with short-term rentals, like an Airbnb, a VRBO, a seasonal rental, so forth and so on, those properties are, and the public involved, are also subject to fair housing laws uh, because a short-term rental is still a rental. A seasonal rental is still a rental. And fair housing laws, there are state fair housing laws and there are federal fair housing laws, and not as well as there are license laws that where violation of any of these laws Number one is a real estate agent can impact your license. Your license can be suspended, revoked, or fined. Um, you as a public individual can also be charged with violating the law and a uh, civil litigation lawsuit against you or against your buyer or against your seller. So the point of this video is to really take some time and create a system that you work, that you can use, number one, that's going to make your life and your job more efficient, more systematic, more routine, um, and will help protect you against uh, the charge of violating any fair housing laws and will help you provide great customer service for your prospects, customers, and clients. I'm curious, comment below, what are some other ideas that you guys have? What are some things that you do consistently or that you have seen done in practice that you think, gosh, that's a really good idea. I'm going to start to incorporate that in my interaction with buyers, sellers, and prospects. Thank you guys so much for watching. Davis Sparks, broker of Maximum One Greater Atlanta Realtors, satisfying your needs with service, innovation, and education.